Hello, my name is Richard Farley. I'm a clinical scientist part of the Leicester Radiation Safety Service. This is a subservice part of medical physics, a part of the UHL NHS Trust. This presentation will be discussing X-ray and plane imaging radiology basics. What I'll be covering in this talk. Initially, I'll be discussing what is meant by radiation, the discovery of X-ray radiation, how are X-rays produced, how are radiography images formed from X-rays. So what do we mean by radiation? The generic definition of radiation can be defined as the emission and propagation of energy in a particular form through space or through a medium. We can break down this statement further with the highlighted components, where emission is a source of radiation that is produced and discharged from a something. The example of a candle as a source of energy that we can feel this energy is heat. Propagation is the movement and transfer of this energy from one point to another. With the example of a stone falling into water, the energy moves radially away from the point of impact as waves. Then radiation can come in different types of forms, such as waves, particles or rays. With the example of energy released from lightning, creating radiation in the form of light rays and also sound waves. The type of radiation discussed in this talk is electromagnetic or EM radiation. This is a ray form, which we also call photons. This type of radiation exhibits both particle and wave characteristics. All EM radiation propagates at the same speed, this being 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is also known as the speed of light. In addition, EM radiation is massless. The spectrum for EM radiation is defined by the photon properties, wavelength and frequency, where the energy of this radiation increases with frequency and inversely with wavelength. Thus, energy is a function of these properties. Based on these variables, EM radiation can be split into different bands as indicated in this graph, from the lowest energy radio waves to the most energetic X and gamma rays, with the other bands in between. Humans are tuned to a relatively narrow bandwidth of EM radiation that allows us to see in this visible spectrum. Thus light is a type of EM radiation. We can also define this spectrum into ionizing and non-ionizing, where it is generally considered this boundary is at 100 nanometers at the far UV radiation edge. At this point of a high frequency EM radiation, this will provide enough energy to eject a bound electron from an atom, thus resulting in an ion of net electrical charge. EM radiation also becomes more penetrating as its energy and frequency increases. Thus, X and gamma radiation can pass through certain objects or barriers, while non-ionising EM radiation is completely blocked. As previously discussed, there is a wide spectrum of EM radiation that allows for many applications. Ionising EM radiation that is high frequency and energetic is able to penetrate the human anatomy. X-rays are an essential tool in clinical diagnostics and for use as image guidance in interventional procedures. Gamma radiation is used in the field of nuclear medicine. This enables visualisation of cancerous tumours as well as physiological processes. More recent advances uses hybrid imaging systems, which combines both these elements as indicated in the rendered image. This is of a PET CT system, which is a positron emission tomography and a, and a typical computer tomography system. So when was X-ray radiation discovered? The discovery of X-rays is credited to Wilhelm Röntgen, a German physicist on the 8th of November 1895, approximately 125 years ago. Whilst conducting one of his experiments, he accidentally observed a faint green fluorescence of light. He concluded this was a result of an unidentified phenomenon that he referred to as X. Thus the term X-rays were born from this point. However, in some countries, these are still referred to as Röntgen rays rather than X-rays, and there is an associated unit of radiation quantity still noted as Röntgens. From further investigation and experiment, the earliest known radiograph was taken of his wife's hand 
This you can still see bone structures as well as her wedding ring, this appearing a lot darker as this is more attenuating. His work was acknowledged, leading to him receiving the first Nobel Prize in the field of physics in 1901. The discovery of X-rays was published and made public a couple of months after Ronken's work. There was a scramble globally as scientists set to replicate this new radiation. As well as developing new experiments and findings, this led to over a thousand published articles relating to X-rays in the first year alone. Early clinical use included for dental radiography, but the exposure times then were significantly greater than today's exposure of several milliseconds rather than the 25 minutes needed back then. Its use was also apparent in surgical procedures, as this image shows a radiograph being used to help locate a bullet within the skull and aid its extraction. Other early interesting concepts and uses included x-rays being used for determining a person's shoe size, as well as therapeutic treatment, such as for headaches. However, none of which are continually practiced today for obvious radiation safety issues. For the context of this talk, x-rays are in relation to clinical, clinical diagnostic use. As back when Rontgen accidentally discovered x-rays, the same principle of these being electrically created and controlled applies today. Thus, we are able to produce x-rays and stop these exposures electronically. This is analogous to switching on a light off and on. However, the process is still very inefficient, with only less than 1% of the energy resulting in the production of x-rays. The remainder of the energy results in heating of the x-ray tube and adjacent components. This is still one of the limitations of x-ray tubes and the production of x-rays. Though modern engineering advancements has enabled greater heat capacity and better heat sinks of these systems. Again, as back with the original production of X-rays, there are two mechanisms leading to the creation of such. Characteristic X-rays that have defined energy values determined by the material that they originate from. Bremsstrahlung X-rays are created as a result of a deacceleration process, where this kinetic energy is given to X-rays of varying energy. Thus, the whole process leads to a continuous X-ray spectrum of relative number of photons as a function of X-ray energy. The main mechanism of X-ray tubes has generally remained constant over time. After initialising an X-ray exposure, a small current is applied across the negatively charged cathode filament. This creates electrons to be ejected from the cathode atoms by a process called fermionic emission. The effect of this results in a cloud of negatively charged electrons. A large electrical potential between the cathode and anode is then applied, creating an electric field. As the anode is positively charged, this causes the cloud of electrons to accelerate towards this anode. Due to the design of the X-ray tube, this stream of electrons are focused towards a small finite point on the anode known as the focal spot. It is at this location that the production of X-rays occur due to interaction of the highly energetic electrons and the anode material. However, the tube requires to be evacuated of any gases, otherwise the process of X-ray production would not work. Surrounding the X-ray tube is a glass envelope to encompass all of the major components and to allow the interior to be in a vacuum. The process of X-ray production is isotropic, with these propagating in all directions from the focal spot. Thus, for radiation safety purposes, the casing of the tube requires to be shielded to stop any leakage X-rays into the environment. A small window is located to control the direction and projection of X-rays towards a target. The figures show a typical diagnostic X-ray spectrum with the X-ray photon energy on the X-axis and the number of photons in the energy band on the Y-axis. The maximum energy of X-rays are always limited to the maximum potential of the electric field applied between the anode and cathode, thus we are able to control what X-ray energy we need. Due to the shape of the spectrum, the average energy is not the midpoint between the highest and lowest energies, but is typically one third of the maximum energy. Characteristic type X-rays can be seen as sharp peaks as having specific energy values, where on the bottom graph, the energy of these remain the same even if the maximum energy is varied from 120 kV to 80 kV. The remainder of the shape is due to Bremsstrahlung X-ray radiation, as the electrons decelerate, they give off this excess energy into a variety of energies to the X-rays.
Factors impacting the shape of this profile include the initial number of X-ray photons, which are linearly proportional to the electron cloud from the cathode filament. X-ray tube filtration will filter out low energy at soft X-rays, such the number of these photons can vary even for the same maximum energy. Overall, we're able to design and develop X-ray tubes so they can be tuned for specific clinical tasks. We have discussed X-ray production, so how does this translate to forming a radiographic image? There are many variables that will impact the production of the final image, with these considered as part of the imaging chain. The quantity of X-ray photons produced will need to be considered as whether this is appropriate, such as will enough of these reach the image receptor to form an appropriate image. In addition, the quality of X-rays refers to the shape and the energy of the X-ray spectrum, so determining how penetrating this radiation is and whether it can pass through radio, radio opaque objects. The object or target being investigated will impact on the image formed and whether the appropriate clinical information can be obtained from the X-ray quantity and the X-ray quality. There are a multitude of different receptor systems that have significantly changed over time, from wet film screen processing producing an analog image to modern digitally acquired images. Each have their unique characteristics and will respond differently to the aforementioned factors in the production of a final image. Other components to consider will be radiographic technique, pro projection, such as whether this is AP or PA, as depending on the anatomy can lead to magnification of certain objects. System controls to enhance image production, such as anti-scatter grids, as well for digital systems that allow for greater retrospective manipulation of clinical image, images can be used as well. That will allow additional information without extra burden, radiation burden to the patient. The production of an X-ray image is fundamentally due to the interaction of X-rays with matter and how these are attenuated. All materials and objects will attenuate X-rays with a level of this attenuation varying. This will depend on the material type and the path length that the X-rays propagate through. Attenuation is a non-linear process. This is an exponential process. This is demonstrated in the graph seen on this slide. There are two main mechanisms for X-ray attenuation, the photoelectric effect, PA, and Compton scatter. These are considered a diagnostic X-ray range up to 150 kV that we typically use. Photoelectric effect is a process that an X-ray photon is completely absorbed by an atom. The byproduct of this interaction will lead to an electron being ejected from this atom system. This can then go on to secondary interactions with other atoms. The photoelectric effect is strongly dependent on the material atomic number Z as this increases the greater strength of the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is also inversely dependent on the X-ray photon energy. Thus, as the energy increases, the weak, weaker the PE effect becomes. Hence why higher energetic photons are more penetrating. Compton scattering is different than the PE effect, but the X-ray production is not completely, the X-ray photon is not completely absorbed. Instead of, the, instead of this, this interacts with an atom it will give off some of its energy, and also it is de deviated a certain angle. It can then go on to make other interactions with other atoms, following the same process. Compton scattering is dependent on the material's density, thus a gas will have weaker Compton scattering effect, while a solid will result in a greater Compton scattering effect. The graph shows the relative strength of the PE effect and Compton scattering as a function of a material atomic number and X-ray photon energy where you can see for high Z and low energy that the photoelectric effect is dominant, while for, while for higher energy Compton is the more dominant. The other process pair production doesn't need to be considered for diagnostic X-ray energies, as this occurs for photons around about 10 times more energetic than for X-rays, diagnostic X-rays. The transmitted X-ray photons will then go on to produce a signal pattern this then forms the clinical image. The initial primary radiation is incident upon an object, or in this case a patient. It then travels through this patient where the sev several of these interactions occurred, occur as previously discussed. 
photoelectric effect is denoted by 2, where this radiation is completely absorbed, completely attenuated. So Compton scattering then has an impact where this can actually exit the body of volume, also deviates from the point of interaction. This can degrade a clinical image, affecting the perceived image quality. The transmitted X-ray photons then interact with the image receptor. This, then, this is then used to create a latent image of the projection through the patient. If this is translated into a signal profile, we can see that the relative pixel value varies as a function of the patient size, but also in certain clinical areas. A higher dense, denser bone region will have higher attenuation, thus the image signal is a lot lower than the surrounding area. Also, the thickness of this clinical object has an impact, as a certain shells can be seen on this particular point. The image then can be displayed as a grayscale from black being zero of pixel value to the maximum bit depth of the image being white and then grayscales in between. And this then can be translated into a pixel grayscale map as which can be seen below and then it's sort of what we see as a typical clinical image. Regards plane radiographic images, these are effectively 2D representation of photon projections through a 3D space, where one of the limitations of this is superimposition of details along the same photon path where these may not be resolved. This is akin to being within the shadow of another object. As previously mentioned, varying attenuation will allow adjacent objects of different density and atomic number to be more easily visualized which is effectively the contrast between such objects. Having objects of greater contrast will enable easy visualization of this clinical information. However, anatomy of similar density or atomic number will be more difficult to, dif to differentiate and visualize. This may impact then on the interpretation of clinical images, which clinicians and radiographers obtaining the images need to be aware of. In addition, there are limitations on, on how small objects can be visualised. This will be dependent on the components along the imaging chain, where two small objects adjacent to one another may not be able to be resolved due to these limitations. Though, contrasts can be artificially enhanced with agents such as barium and iodine. The graph indicated shows a relative attenuation of fat and tissue compared against these contrast agents. This will make it much easier to visualize the use of these agents in clinical images. In addition, it can be seen for lower X-ray energies. It is easier to differentiate between these clinical details of the adipose and skeletal muscle. Thus using the appropriate settings will enable better image contrast. Here are some of the key take home messages from today's presentation. X-rays are a high energy type of electromagnetic radiation that are also penetrating. They can be electrically generated, thus we can control them in terms of where we can turn them on and we can turn them off. Images are formed due to the interactions of X-ray photons within matter, whether this is the photoelectric effect or Compton scattering, where there is a dependency on the X-ray photon energy and the object material. A plain, radiographic, plain image radiograph is effectively a 2D attenuation map of internal objects and structures where due to difference in relative att attenuation, this results in differences in contrast enabling objects to be easily visualized, though there are limitations to 2D radiograph imaging as well. So thank you for listening, and I hope this talk was useful.